For some reason, my we are live. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, whoever is out there uh, in real time uh, watching and listening to us, this is uh, the 45th episode of the Circle of Fellows broadcast. This is a monthly You're broadcast here. over the YouTube Hangout on Air service, uh, which allows us to broadcast live to anybody who wants to watch. Uh, we are IABC fellows uh, who are going to engage in a conversation about IABC's editorial theme of the month. This month, that theme is consumer activism, which is a uh, loaded issue. I was doing research on it because it's not really something I deal with very much, but uh, my God, is there a lot of research out there on this. I uh, want to have the panel introduce themselves. Uh, as always, we're going to go left to right as I see you in the thumbnails on my screen. That's not always the same way other people see the thumbnails, but um, it's how I see it. So I'm the moderator. That's how we're going to do it. Angela, you're up first. I'm Angela Senecas. I'm CEO of my own consulting firm for the last 19 years in just a few weeks. And I focus on uh, communication research and measurement. Great. Uh, George, or, uh, actually, it's Bish uh, is up next. Bish? Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Bish Mukherjee. Um, I have been a consultant um, for many years now uh, to blue chip companies in Australia, India, and other parts of the world um, in marketing, media, public relations, and the lot. Um, I have, I'm on the board of a few organizations as well as an advisor. More when we talk. Thank you. And, and Bish, what time is it where you are? Uh, this is 9.30 now <laughs> in the night. <laughs> I really Definitely appreciate your joining us. Uh, we, we certainly have an international contingent of fellows. It's always great when we're able to. It's a pleasure. <laughs> yep. It's okay. a pleasure. George, you're up next. And I think we're still having technical issues with George. So uh, we'll skip. And Jim. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jim Lukashevsky. Uh, I, too, am the CEO of my own company. Uh, and uh, I, I think I've been around the longest of anybody. Me, you end up the panel. That's how long I've been the CEO of my own company. Um, and I'm actually... Hi, George McGrath. Yeah. Oh. I'm a specialist in contention. Uh, everybody that I have working for is, is somebody's mad at them, and quite often uh, with good reason. And uh, so we sort of start from that basis. So this is really interesting conversation to me this morning. Because uh, this is how people reach me. I just got a call this morning from a school district who is under, now undergoing a uh, an anti chocolate milk drive. So I'm about to learn about chocolate milk and issues facing school districts and chocolate milk. But uh, there's some more people I know who have uh, angry who, who have people angry at them. So. Believe it or not, I have heard of the anti chocolate milk yep. drive. So. That's, uh, that's one that's gained some momentum. Uh, great. George has uh, dropped, so we'll see if he's able to rejoin us. But uh, let's get started. By the way, I, I didn't let everyone know that I am the Director of Internal Communications at WebCore, which is a, a commercial general contractor in San Francisco. Uh, but for 21 years before that, I also had my own company. I just went back into the client side uh, and I'm enjoying it immensely. But um, let's let's start talking about consumer activism. It is on the rise according to the data that I was able to find. Since the start of 2016, one in five Americans has participated in a political rally that's up uh, considerably and 20% of the people who have done that have done it for the first time. Uh, so, there are people who are definitely getting more and more involved. I think some of that may have to do with the political spectrum, but some of it also has to do with the ease of uh, activism. In fact, there's a term called slacktivism, which is you know, taking that activist position from your keyboard with a hashtag. Uh, but social media certainly has made it easier for people to connect around issues. I heard somebody once describe it uh, as you know, in, in the old days, you had to stand on a corner on a, uh, with, a, with a sign and attract a few people so that you could have enough to come to a meeting who could then tell other people and gradually you could build a movement. Uh, now you get out there with a hashtag and, and a couple of tweets and, and people around the world who share your concern uh, or your outrage or whatever it may be are able to join you. 
Um, this raises a lot of issues for public relations, and uh, I think we should probably just start by by talking about, in general, what do you see the role of the communicator as uh, when it comes to activism, consumer activism? Well, I think the communicator is um, one of the more extraordinary keys to resolving these issues, but uh, as an occupation, uh, it's a very grindy job because the folks who are in charge uh, this, I think, seems to be is more changing more active than, than, than the level of activism. I think we're seeing more and more senior people become involved and engaged in these activities because they're getting such a useful reaction from their own constituents and, and from the folks who are, are uh, making life difficult. For them. But uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think the issue, for, it, it, is, it is in a way a pure communications play uh, going down the road with some interesting nuances, which we will talk about on the program today. But clearly, we are the linchpin in this act, in this activity. I think one of the roles for communicators is the listening part of what we're supposed to be doing. I think we spend way too much time sending in, out information, but it is two-way communication. And I think if we're doing our job properly and listening to all of our different stakeholder groups, groups we'd be a little bit ahead of the curve on not being surprised when some of these issues do pop up. Yeah, doesn't it go back to the uh, the IEBC Excellence Study? Uh, I think we're all old enough to remember uh, excellence in organizational communications and public relations, uh, where they talked about environmental scanning and identifying the groups that uh, could take a position against you and uh, getting to know their uh, issues, uh, what they're upset about or, or what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, they, they referred to this as boundary spanning so that you could speak from their side of, of the debate as easily as you can from your employers or your clients uh, and then be able to engage in a dialogue with them. Uh, is, is, is that something that you see organizations doing or are they just reacting as the hashtags emerge? I think and actually, very true. go ahead, please. I was just going to say in the pharmaceutical world, I think they've been doing this for quite a long time because it's patients that often can get upset with pharmaceutical companies. And what they've been doing is they've been getting involved in the patient advocacy groups for the various disease states that their patients are in. So they become partners with them. Not that they agree on everything, but they are used to working together rather than working against each other. The role, uh, the role of the communicator is critical in uh, most of the cases that we come across, which have got a crisis uh, situation built into it. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, a case in point, I'll bring in the Union Carbide tragedy that happened way back, but um, it affected like 500,000 people and it was the worst uh, industrial disaster in the history of, uh, of the world. Um, Warren Anderson was the CEO, and our own Bob Bazot was the communications director. And within hours of this tragedy unfolding, Bob Bazot came into, dash, uh, air dashed into Mumbai. And uh, one of the first calls he made was to me, and we sat together and had a chat. And you know what? They didn't have a communications guy in place. That was one of the most critical things that they were really, really yearning for. They said, oh gosh, if we had somebody here who could move a few things around, who could talk to people in Delhi, who could do some central government exercises, you know, we would have been in, in much better shape. So just a point in, um, uh, brought in here that the role of the communicator is absolutely critical and uh, it, it eases the way towards a better uh, society, better understanding, and a better relationship. I think uh, the thing about activism is it, it's a pattern. Uh, all activism follows a fairly routine set of principles, um, and uh, the, the, probably the greatest reference source um, uh, is a, a guy named Saul Alinsky, who uh, uh, was active in, in Chicago in the old days under the original Mayor Daley. And uh, he's legendary in his um, creative approach to, to mobilizing communities. At one time, 
I think this is a apocryphal story, but um, the city council was going to do something that affected uh, the, the the poorer people in uh, in Chicago it was a tax or something like that, and so uh, Alinsky threatened to essentially paralyze O'Hare Airport if they went ahead with it, and um, forgive the language, but he called it a, a shit in, and what he did was he he mobilized people to fill all the bathrooms at O'Hare, and they would stay filled until the, the city council relented. And the city oh, council gosh. actually stopped the same day he <laughs> made the allegation. It's a great story. Um, I don't think he actually executed it, but, but everybody believed he could because he was a man who could put people to the street. Um, and this is the interesting thing about what we're talking about, uh, understanding activism. He, he wrote a book called Rules for Radicals. It's still in print. It is the Bible, actually, for teaching radical activism around the world. There are schools of radical activism that are devoted to his work um, and the work of, of newer uh, activists. But his fundamental principles, his 13 principles, um, are a good foundation and an easy foundation for people to learn who are energized to participate in this. Um, and so one of the things we have to really understand is that we can actually anticipate pretty much what's going to happen and who's going to be attacked, um, and how they're going to be attacked. But the, and in, which makes what Angela does extraordinarily important, because these, these things are not hidden. Uh, their, their exposure um, and demonstration is part of the routine of activist attacks. And these can be tracked, they can be monitored. And the reason for doing that has already been mentioned. And that is the, the absolute necessity of engagement with the people you don't like. This is probably the hardest, the biggest barrier in dealing with activism is convincing people in charge of your organization that you have to sit down and talk to these people. Uh, my favorite technique is to actually establish a working group in which there are people representing the company, people representing the, 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 the toughest opposition if they participate, um, and uh, people uh, representing other elements in the play, so to speak, so that we have this, this dialogue that was referred to earlier going on. And we call it a working group because if we give it any of the name words, we're sort of confusing the picture. But um, uh, there, there, are standard, there are standard objections as to why uh, organizations don't participate. Um, and it, it's an interesting approach. Uh, they'll say, well, we're a good company. You know, why, why don't we get credit for the good we're doing as well as all this crap we're getting from the other side? Uh, and my answer is because. Um, why don't uh, why don't these people sit down and act rationally so we can come to the, the solutions of, you know in, in a mutually productive way? And the answer is again because uh, this is the way it is. Why do we get credit for the good things we do? Well, because you're not going to. Uh, this is the way it is. It, it, it's sort of an exercise in reality that we have to repeat once in a while because. From the perspective of the folks who run large organizations and small organizations who are being attacked, um, the attackers are irrational. In reality, what they are are experts in the behavior and beliefs of the folks who are running the organization that they don't like. Um, so it is, it is a different mental set altogether to work in this environment uh, successfully. Um, George, looks like you've uh, been able to Re relocate yourself to some place with better bandwidth. Yes, I have. Sorry to be late. Yeah, and have great. to join everybody. Uh, if you could introduce yourself, and then uh, what I asked as a first question was just what you think the role of the communicator is when addressing consumer activism. Oh, hi. I'm George McGrath from uh, New York City, and where I had my own communications consulting firm. And I think the communicator's role is critical. Uh, we, we basically or the key people who facilitate dialogue between our organizations and all the different stakeholders we deal with. I think we're also the folks from time to time who have to speak truth to management and press them to get involved in those discussions. So our role, our role is really critical. Great. Uh, I did want to take a minute, uh, which I neglected to do at the top of the show, uh, to let people know if you're watching live, you can ask questions or share your observations it's uh, via Twitter with the hashtag COF, that's for Circle of Fellows, COF45. Uh, and I'm monitoring that and will uh, share any questions or observations or comments uh, 
uh, that you care to contribute to the conversation. Uh, there was a survey that was done last year. It was by Weber Shandwick called Battle of the Wallets, Changing Landscape of Consumer Activism. Uh, it had some interesting data. 83% of US and UK uh, consumer activists agree that uh, they should buy from companies that are doing the right things from their perspective and related to the issues that uh, are important to them. 59% say it's more important than ever to boycott companies that are doing the wrong things. Uh, that's a pretty wide gap. It seems like there are more people who are likely to support you when you're doing the right things than there are to punish you when you're doing the wrong things, again, from, from the perspective of the activist. Uh, does that suggest anything to you about uh, the, the way companies should react to this? Uh, should, should we be doing more of the right things that we identify among our target uh, markets, for example? Uh, should we be listening to what their issues are and seeing if they align with our values or our purpose? Can I jump in with a a uh, little comment on you mentioned about the political activism as well. Sure. Um, today's newspaper uh, here, the Economic Times, had an item saying that uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi are to face trader activism in this state of Tamil Nadu in India. So, which actually means that they will be off the shelves very shortly. This is the... Uh, mm news item that came across. Can you read that? Yep. Yeah, probably, yeah. Okay. So uh, what happens is uh, trade unionism and, uh, you know, uh, consumer activism very often go hands in gloves uh, together, uh, hand in gloves together. So, um, you know, you can't separate one from the other often when it comes to political activism because each party wants to up the ante. And if the party's backup is there, then you've had really had it. We have had situations in um, the companies I have worked for, and we have uh, had to take enormous uh, amount of, uh, um, you know, we had to do an enormous amount of work to get these things fixed, and also to do a lot of work to do precautionary, um, you know, safeguards. So one of the things that happened uh, some time ago uh, was in a smaller scale, like, you know, sometimes these, uh, see, ac political activism and trade unionism also can be uh, sort of in, in two roles. One role would be on a smaller scale, very small scale, maybe on a uh, single unit basis, and the other could be on a pluralistic scale, on a huge, massive mass scale. Now, one of the uh, situations where uh, what happened in one of the uh, restaurants in Sydney, in Australia, was that a uh, uh, Hindu um, vegetarian Brahmin family went to eat dinner at this very nice Indian restaurant. And uh, when they ate dinner, they loved it. And at the end of the meal, towards the end of the meal, they realized that there were one or two pieces of uh, meat in the food that was served. And these people are diehard vegetarians, you know. So they wouldn't uh, brook any nonsense. So they called up the manager and they threw a tantrum. They said, what the hell is this going on? Uh, your unit should be shut down. We'll call up the uh, political parties. We'll call up the leaders and, you know, see to it that your unit is shut down. And then uh, um, the situation blew up. It came in the newspapers. It, it became a very big story locally and then uh, you know these people were asking for information as to what we can do and guidance as what you can do then it so happened that they uh, called me and i went in and i had a chat with them and then i uh, and then i asked them what are they asking for what do they want and they said they want a free trip to india in first class all four of them and they want to go to varanasi which is the you know um a place where uh, all things pure happen. They want to take a dip in the Ganges River, which will rid them of all their impurities. And then they come, they stay there for a week and do prayers and penance and all that. Then they come back to Sydney. I said, look, 
um, why do you think that you should agree to this? And he said, no, we don't want to agree, but you, isn't that the you know, tenets of Hinduism? I said, well, really, you know, if you look at it, um, there's a sacred book in, uh, in uh, Christianism. You know, uh, there is the Bible, there is the Quran, where they have the books and you can read out the lines. But unfortunately, in Hinduism, there is no sacred book as such, which you can call, okay, this is the book of the Hindus, and this is what we have to follow. So this is all by practice and thoughts and procedures, and each community believes in something different from the other. So really speaking, if they go to a court of law, nothing will happen, because they can't quote any scripture to say that they, a vegetarian cannot eat uh, uh, you know, non-veg food. So that's how it is. And they um, said no to the deal. And uh, then uh, the, the movement slowly, slowly dried off, died off because, you know, there was no substance to it. So this is a case where a political, uh, politically backed situation misfired because these guys were politically connected and it misfired. It didn't work. But there are other situations where it will work. Thank you. And I think that raises a really fascinating issue uh, because I think you know, when people start a boycott or a consumer protest, uh, I think a lot of times we assume we know what it is they want. And you know, very often times that's not the case. In fact, one study uh, that I looked at, again, this was at uh, Weber Shandwick's study, they divided protesters, activists between uh, boycotters and bycotters, bycotters being the ones who will buy from the companies that are doing things they like and stop buying or resist buying from those that they don't. Uh, among the boycotters, the, the main thing they want to do is have the company change the way it does business, 36%. Uh, 35% want to damage the company's reputation. 20% uh, want to get their complaint noticed. 18% uh, want to harm sales. 15% want to force an apology. Among the bycotters, 48% uh, want to help the company's reputation, 27% want to help sales, 19% want to change the way the company does business, 13% want to improve employee morale, which I thought, found particularly interesting, uh, and 12% want to have the company notice their support for them. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, recognizing what the people who are complaining are, are actually hoping to get from their complaint, uh, I think is an important first step in addressing that. You know, this sort of goes back to what you mentioned in the excellent study, Shell. There was another thing in there about two different ways of, um, of communicating that involves listening or the research that I mentioned at the beginning. One is uh, symmetrical and the other is asymmetrical communication. The asymmetrical would be what companies have often done. They will listen. They are going to monitor sentiment on social media. They'll, they might do some surveys, some focus groups. So they do care about what all these different stakeholder groups are thinking, including those activists. But they do it for the purpose of better manipulating them through the messaging they intend to do down the road. That's asymmetrical. All the power still stays with the company. I think what a lot of these activist groups really are hoping for and needing in order for things to get resolved is more symmetrical, where yes, the company is listening to what these people are having to say, what it is they're looking for, but the company has to be willing to make changes as well. Changes in its policies, changes in the way it, it works, operates, sells, treats its employees, whatever. And if they're not, then all that listening is not going to really help deal with the situation long term. I think one of the one of the most important things that goes on in these transactions, these communication transactions, is that the company has to be much more aggressive in speaking, in essence, what I call correcting, clarifying, and commenting on what people are saying about them in the, in the, in the public venue and in social media. Um, and to sort of keep up with the record, you might say. Uh, otherwise, the, 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 the sort of the bad news and the, the attacks all pile up, and it's as though the, the company is not doing anything about it, even if, if they, they are engaged even directly with the people involved. There has to be a, a public component to respond to what's going on out there. And if for no other reason than to settle down the audiences who nat naturally want to support you, uh, often as employees and retirees and others, but they're, they're big bodies of people and customers for that matter. 
but they need to know that 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 we're noticing what's going on against us and that we're interacting with them in a very constructive positive helpful way the goal of responding is, is not to call them a bunch of dumb whatever uh, it's really to, 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 as i mentioned to comment um clarify or correct information that's being shared um in this day and age where everybody would say what everybody says is out there somewhere you have to be you have to be out there in this sort of documentable way as well, if for no other reason than to you know, keep the record, at least of parity going forward. Because the, the, my view of what's happening in activism is that it's becoming just very much more sophisticated. In the, um, the piece that was uh, sent to us, at least, uh, the, the, the uh, broadcast podcast by John Devaney of the New Orleans, uh, he, he showed some examples of some of the best targets in the world, act, activists against uh, McDonald's and, and uh, you mentioned several really large brands. Um, these are in essence premier targets because for the reason Angela talked about, um, a good target is one that is responsive and uh, essentially sort of engages in the process. And I think this is one of the hardest parts for management even these days to get used to. And that is you've got to be in the game um, or you're not in the game. And it's going to take some time to work these things out. But the biggest project I ever worked on was the sweatshop issue of uh, now some 10, 15 years ago. Um, and my clients were the, were the large clothing companies. And I visited uh, plants in uh, various places in South Central America, Central America, um, Saipan. These were sweatshops. There was just no question about it. You couldn't deny it. Once you want, the first plant I visited was in Tegucigalpa. And uh, there were these big labels all over the building. They manufactured for a lot of the big brands. But, you know, you, you could tell just from the layout of things that this is, this is not an ordinary workspace. Uh, and they were sweatshops. And I'm, and I'm visiting with a bunch of muckety-muck from big companies. And I'm saying, why is your name in this building? You know, you, you can't be operating this. You know, this, this is evidence of what everybody's claiming is going on. Um, in that same first trip, we also had... A group of uh, a working group people, uh, labor union activists, religious activists, um, so that we could also we all experience these things at the same time in real time and begin to talk about them going forward. This is a big deal. There was a book several years ago, Paul Gillen, a friend of mine, wrote called The Attack of the Customers. Uh, and in this, he divided consumer activists into categories. He, he says there are, are cons a, a casual complainers. He says this is the background noise of, of customer relations. Uh, is usually around customer-focused policies. These are things like Verizon sucks. Why, why the hell uh, don't they fix the network? Uh, U.S. Airways sucks so bad. Been sitting on the tarmac for over an hour. These are things they tend to tweet. Um, then uh, there are the extortionists, and uh, Bish, I think that's what you were talking about, the ones who wanted the first-class flight in the week uh, in India. Uh, they're motivated by some kind of a, a personal gain. Uh, and he says the strategy for addressing them is, is to fight fire with fire. Uh, committed crusaders are ones with a higher calling, um, and for them you want to share facts and, and education. And then there are irritable influencers, people who are throwing their weight around. Um, and the strategy there, he says, is to remain calm and prepare to fall on your sword. Uh, so I don't know what you think about those categories, but is it, does it make sense uh, as you see the, the attacks coming from activists to identify which of these categories or maybe other categories they fall in um, before deciding on a strategy to deal with them? Yeah, fire I, with I, fire. It, it, it's, this, is, this is an exercise. It's, it's sort of a brainiac's strength. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm involved with this every single day, and the, the pressure on the part of the person or organization being attacked is to get the matter resolved. So rather than label people who are participants, we tend to focus on what are the issues and questions we can deal with, and therefore what are the issues, and also uh, what are the issues and questions and perceptions that are out there that we can essentially begin working on to move toward resolution. The more we try to analyze and pick these things apart, uh, the, the less time we spend on face-to-face -face meetings and really working to get the issues and questions resolved. They're going to be resolved in somebody's favor. Um, so let's get to it and get it done. 
But uh, you know, these these, these uh, labels are amusing, but they aren't that helpful. Plus, I think dangerous. The labels are dangerous because they, when you label somebody, whatever the labels are, uh, they know you're labeling them. And it mm -hmm. energizes them. They need this actually to keep their energy up. Being an activist is hard work, uh, and they need they need our bad behavior to continue, continue to energize what they're doing. Jim mentioned about uh, McDonald's, and uh, Shell mentioned about fighting fire with fire. And here's an example. And uh, this is this is actually happening right now in India. Uh, McDonald's is fighting a very big battle here. The entire uh, north and west of India uh, is being run by a, with a partner. And that partner has created problems for McDonald's. And that partner has gone into a political activism situation where it has got the backing. They have got the backing of uh, some political parties and all that. And therefore, they have been exploiting the situation and demanding uh, facilities, demanding more and more, demanding staff, demanding money, demanding everything under the sun. So McDonald's decided to fight fire with fire. And they said, OK, come on to the right uh, table, negotiating table, and let's discuss what you have. And everybody said that, look, McDonald's is never going to pay up the huge amounts of money that they are asking for. And they did. They said, OK, this is the money you want. Take this and get lost. We just <laughs> don't want you guys, okay? And that's how it's been settled now. Yep. It's it's interesting that you raise McDonald's, Bish, because there is a website called McSpotlight uh, that is a consumer activist-run website that is uh, trying to shine the light on what they see as unethical practices by the organization. It's an intriguing form of consumer activism to start a website. There's one called Untied uh, that is all about uh, poor service from United Airlines. Uh, right now, if you go to untied.com, you're going to see the site itself kind of fuzzed out and a statement over it saying that United has sued uh, to make the site go away uh, and a court in Canada had found there was cause for uh, an injunction uh, against the site, and he's trying to raise money for a legal defense fund, um, which I find to be an interesting strategy because silencing your critics uh, with uh, legal action seems to me to be a great way to inflame passion uh, among those who see that as a David and Goliath type of a, uh, an approach. I think, you know, whatever the, I've, I've worked in a lot of cultures, not every culture, but the, the big question always is, have you talked to these guys? Have you, have you sat down and, and asked questions um, and had a face-to-face -face meeting? Uh, and you know, your, your mother asks you that. And if you're an activist, your mother asks you, why don't you sit down with these people? Why don't you keep attacking them? Um, you know, it really boils down to this sort of get your head out of the sand process and sit down and start the talking. The greatest detoxifier of these circumstances he is essentially talking about the talking you're doing with these people uh, and these groups, these organizations. It stabilizes a lot of the people who are on the fence. Uh, a boycott to me, boycott is a very often a very, a very vague and hard to establish threat because if you're asking somebody to change their lifestyle, like going to McDonald's, uh, it, it's pretty hard to accomplish. You can you accomplish some of it, but for the most part. You know, it's other techniques that are more active and more fun to do for activists than boycotts. Because, again, because they, they often have to sacrifice something they actually like in their life, so to speak. But the real issue, again, boils down to getting getting face-to-face -face and talking about it. Um, because it has this moderating effect on the energy that activism tends to present. One of the... I'm sorry, George, go ahead. Well, actually, I want to... Oops, George, we just lost your audio. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I think we're all sort of centering on the importance of, of dialogue and engaging with activists, whether it's an individual or a group, and they talk to us, and focus on solving the real problem. Going back to the restaurant example, Bish told us, the problem is not, you don't have an activist problem, you got a problem in the kitchen, plating the food. And that's that's what you got to that's what you got to fix. 
And, you know, a lot of this is, in, you know, I think a lot of times businesses can feel very defensive. You know, how dare somebody question our policies? We have the highest standards, et cetera. Well, in some cases we slip. And in those cases, we have to admit, look, we had an issue here. Our real problem is we're having a problem with our food handling procedures. We have a problem in the factory where we're making the products. We're having a problem in our, in our retail bank branches where we're serving our customers. We're going to focus on fixing the problem. And in fact, we want to get more input from you, the customer or the activist, in terms of how you think we can fix that. We may not be able to do all those things. We want to listen and take that into account. Too often, you know, the, the inclination of management and, and the law department is to go into a defensive crouch and say, geez, we're going to get sued or we're going to get a lot of bad, bad headlines. How do we deflect this? How do we stop it? And the fact is, in a digital age, you're not going to stop it. Anybody's an activist. You know, it doesn't have to be Greenpeace going against you. It's somebody who bought your toilet paper and doesn't like the fact that you don't have any recycled content in it. And they start a campaign about it from their and for working from their pajamas at home. No, there's a real wisdom in the art, the reference articles in Communication World for this broadcast in this month, and they focus on change in behavior and attitude in the C-suite. Um, and it has been one sort of masterful change for, uh, over the years in activism that the, the target is the C-suite. And uh, the articles in, in Communication World really talk about the moderating language, the approach that the, the, the much more communal, communally, with, with communitization of the, of the language and behavior of leaders of companies. Because, it, you know, as one of the article points out, you know, the, one of the biggest problems large organizations are facing uh, is activism by the employees who are hacked off uh, by the behavior of their own companies. Um, yeah. and there's some graphic examples of this. Okay. But I think Google. one of the issues really for most people who are new to this behavior is that there has to be these changes in ourselves and our approach and our attitude and our temperament um, to even have the conversations. I actually never use the word dialogue. Dialogue to me is a management word that says, shut up, sit down and listen. Um, I think we'll be fine. So I always talk about in terms of conversation, I talk about uh, meetings and I, I avoid the sort of uh, characteristic language of management. And it takes some training and some thought on the part of these executives to see the light about how important it is to be more humane, to be more compassionate, to be more obviously uh, doing more than just listening. They're actually responding and changing their behaviors, their plans and ideas as a result of these conversations. It's, it's, it's an extraordinarily interesting situation from a communications perspective. I could build on what Jim was just talking about. He mentioned employee activism. That is really re a rising issue, especially with the younger workforce that's values based and they're vocal and they're visible. A couple, I think, Shell, you were the one who first sent me this link a few years ago where there was a woman at Nike who was having a lot of uh, difficulties. She was getting great performance reviews, was never being promoted. Um, she was being uh, disrespected by male managers in public meetings with, uh, with her peers. And she went to her management chain, she went to HR and nothing changed. And what she did is she did a survey of her own, which of course anyone can do a survey monkey survey. She sent the link to women she knew and asked them to pass it on to other women they knew. She got all the results and she shared it with the CEO. And the result of that was that a number of people in her management chain and the VP of HR got fired because there actually was a problem and the company did need to fix it. Another similar one that's uh, even more current now is at Google. There are two women, Claire Stapleton and Meredith Whitaker, who uh, started uh, doing something a little bit more vocal and activist regarding sexual harassment, which was being ignored. It wasn't being addressed properly in the town hall meeting. They got 2,000 employees to sign up for a special interest group to explore equal pay and sexual misconduct. November of last year, 20,000 Google employees walked out of the company because of this. This was all part of the employee activism. They were looking for fairness, uh, justice, and respect. And so this all kind of died down, not assuming that the company's actually done something about it. But I've just been reading that just last month, both of those two women 
are feeling the pressure of having been whistleblowers. One of them has been demoted and half of her staff was taken away. The other one was in charge of an AI ethics council and they just did away with the council. If you can imagine Google doing away with an AI ethics council, that can't be a business reason. That's a huge issue right now. So this is still emerging, but I think we need to be really careful, especially if we're more involved with internal communication. The activism very well may bubble up from insider organizations and it can spill over to the outside. So we need to make sure we are listening and dialoguing in a real way in terms of being ready to make changes as a company when these issues are being brought up because it's going to do nothing but but great, grow greater. Yeah, Microsoft and... I tend to refer to this kind of executive behavior, this retaliation as testosterosis, okay? Women have it too. <laughs> Uh, it's this notion of rather than doing something, we're going to hit back, we're going to insult, demean, humiliate, um, that I guess make us feel good for a while. But that those are important and uh, striking crisis to face down the road. And retaliation for acts or internal activism for the benefit of an organization and whistleblowing still is an extraordinarily uh, risky proposition for people working internally despite federal laws for the protective activity and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. It's a big risk to stand up and, uh, and be counted. There's also employee activism uh, underway at Microsoft, and it's over company policies around uh, doing work for uh, the Defense Department, right. uh, that the employees feel that they shouldn't be uh, contributing to any kind of work that results in, in people dying. Um, and uh, Satya Nadella, the CEO, has been pushing back hard uh, on that, saying, you know, we want to listen and we want to engage, but uh, we're, we're, we're not going to stop doing this work. Uh, and I believe there's some at Facebook on a couple of issues. One is uh, people whose political views are right of center, feeling marginalized in the organization. And another one is about the use of facial recognition technology uh, being used by law enforcement and uh, their employees who are upset about that. But employees are, are feeling more and more emboldened uh, to take these positions. And because they have tools like Slack and Teams and the like, it makes it easy for them to band together. I know mean, Facebook, I think they're even using Facebook groups in the uh, workplace product, the, int the internal version of, of Facebook that's available to any company that wants to pay for it. Uh, that they're actually creating groups to organize around these things. So, Angela, I think you're, you're absolutely right. That's something to pay attention to. Uh, we seem to... We, we, because in addition to Glassdoor.com, which we probably, most of our companies are tracking to see what's going on, two other ones have emerged that we also need to look at. One is coworker.org, that's co-worker.org. Uh, there was a guy from uh, Publix who wanted to grow a beard and it was against company policy and he got signatures and a hashtag for free the beard. And now that's kind of a minor thing, but that really worked very well. They actually support, that organization supports worker complaints. Uh, the other one is thelayoff.com, which almost always is correct way in advance before companies are announcing their layoffs. So those are just two I'd say that if you're worried about employee activism, keep your eye on those. Going back to consumer activism, I wanted to talk about this idea of changing the conversation because it's something I read about a lot. Uh, I, I heard a case study during a presentation at a conference. Uh, it was one of the diaper uh, companies. That I, I, if my memory serves, it was Pampers. Uh, they had reformulated the diaper. Uh, their R&D people had been working on this for years. Uh, they had put it through all of the rigorous tests that any company like this would do. Uh, and they released it. And one very influential mommy blogger uh, started reporting heavily that uh, she, her, her baby was experiencing diaper rash, uh, had never had that before with the old formulation of diaper. And everything they tried to do to quash this discussion uh, failed. Uh, all of her readers and followers were, were joining into this and people were reporting diaper rash that they were experiencing as well. Uh, a new marketing VP came in and looked at this and said, look, everybody's talking about diaper rash. Let's talk about diaper rash rather than all of the research we had done and all of the testing we had done on this. We've got that information out there. So now let's just start uh, producing content through our car, uh, content marketing engine uh, about diaper rash, what it is, where it comes from, and what to do about it. And that's suddenly what everybody started talking about. And this, this mommy blogger who had been so successful in rallying her 
followers to this cause uh, found that uh, she, she could no longer whip up any enthusiasm for that conversation and it just trailed off. Um, so I, I, I think that's an interesting approach to take, uh, especially when you feel that you are actually in the right, uh, but nobody's listening to that. Uh, what do you think about changing the conversation? I don't actually look at it as changing the conversation. This is what activism has been about from uh, from the very beginning, taking the, the, the statements, behaviors, and attitudes of the, their target organization or philosophy or whatever and using it against them um, simply by holding them up often you know, to, to the light, so to speak. So uh, I, th I think this is, this is a, an important strategy to continue the conversation um, and essentially nudge it in a different direction but uh, I wouldn't necessarily call on you changing the subject. And, and, and this is a very productive approach to dealing with these issues. The Can only, I, the, the the only danger I see, though, is, is that businesses tend to take the sort of academic approach to problems like this, and they do studies. Because um, they believe that, you know, the truth lies in the data. And the truth actually never lies in the data, uh, because data doesn't do anything it's just there um and anybody can use the data for any particular purpose uh good guys and bad guys so, um and and but business believes and this is the fundamental problem actually with management education in our culture you know we keep these people that somehow data makes them omnipotent data makes them um better than anybody else smarter than anybody else that sort of thing and they use data as a way of punishing people and it's one of the greatest irritants that there is out there. Um, when you pile on the data, every, every study you pull, you, you pull from a corporate point of view just tells people, this, you know, here's how stupid you really are. Uh, here's you know, 10,000 words and 4,500 examples of how dumb you are. Um, there has to be a better approach. And the, actually engaging in the issue itself, as this example shows, it, it, I think it's a pretty good strategy. Bish, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, I wanted to jump in with a with an example here. Um, this would combine uh, a bit of employee activism as well as uh, consumer activism. Uh, this is uh, uh, from uh, India, um, a part of the country um, where numbers matter, a part of the world where numbers matter. And uh, this is about a power company, a power distribution company, and they were they are distributing power to um, to 10 million consumers in a small state because the numbers are large there okay now this this company decided that okay we don't have a sort of a con con consumer redressal cell so what we would like to do is to put up a, a center where people could come and lodge their uh, suggestions and complaints and we could take the matters further. Um, mind you, this company was having a, a very small percentage of complaints coming in any, in any case. It was less than 1%. But still, they wanted to be right up there and said, we want to get rid of even the 0.5% of complaints that we get. Now, uh, space was allotted in the uh, building complex where they would um, have this consumer sell and it was a very big building they planned on. Um, now, next we know is that uh, some contractors came in and overnight they chopped off some huge trees which were sitting there. And uh, it so happened that those trees um, had a lot of rare birds coming in and roosting there. And there were quite a few guys from around the uh, city who used to come for early morning walks and even come in their cars with their binoculars and they'll take a look at these birds. Now with these trees gone all of a sudden, you can imagine their plight and they were not happy. So they raised this issue and the employees themselves were very sympathetic to these uh, people, who uh, these bird watchers. So they joined in and they said, well, look, unless the management does something uh, to fix this problem, we are going to cut off the supply of power to the households. And you're talking about 10 million households, which gets power there. So it was a very, very, very difficult situation. 
we borrowed some case studies from elsewhere and one of the case studies from Tampa Electric Company fitted our requirements and we used part of that case study to deal with the matter and uh, it was a successful outcome ultimately after having seen a lot of processions and a lot of strikes and sit outs but we didn't have any cut off of power to the households so that is one of the things which got a lot of publicity in the media it got instant political backing and it got a lot of activists uh, uh, come in into the fray and even today these activists raise these issues that okay this was a big mistake made by the company they did well to you know do things uh, uh, do some other things to fix it so that's a case study i just wanted to share this is great hey we have a question uh from uh, somebody who's viewing, Sharon McIntosh uh, out of Connecticut, asks, how do you decide how to react or not react in a situation when a small group of consumers can be so vocal? Uh, and I think this is something that can happen uh, via Twitter uh, and, and social media, where the, a, a, a small group who don't necessarily represent uh, a majority or a significant number of your customers uh, are out there making a, a lot of noise and maybe even getting media attention. Uh, how do you deal with that? Actually, I, I generally remind my clients that, uh, you know, uh, America was essentially founded by five guys angry at the king, and one of them lived in France the entire time during a revolution. It isn't the number that matters. It's their commitment that matters. So these need to be dealt with as though there were a 1,000 people or 2,000 people. Um, if they had the energy and the, the, uh, the, the perseverance to make trouble, uh, and it doesn't take a bunch. It just takes four, five, three, four. You know, there's a famous statement by Margaret Mead about uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not the mob that changes the world. It's a handful of committed people who stay focused on getting the job done. Yep. Sean, uh, Sean, I have a response for you as well. Um, it so happened that uh, a small group of people uh, they came up saying that uh, they had very bad uh, mouth ulcers due to consumption of fluoride toothpaste. And uh, this took off, like in the media, in the you know public domain and everywhere, that, okay, fluoride is bad for health, and uh, therefore fluoride toothpaste should be banned. It was just a handful of people, mind you. So the companies got together, the toothpaste and tooth powder making companies. There is a lot of tooth powder made in the, um, you know, developing countries. Um, and they approached the uh, medical association, the dental association, and the dental association in coordination with the uh, companies, they sent a team of investigators to find out what exactly is happening in that particular place from where these people are saying that they are having bad mouth ulcers. And they found out that these were the people who were drinking water from a well, which was contaminated. And that was the reason for the fluoride uh, ulcers and, and not the toothpaste as such, because toothpaste has very, very little percentage of fluoride in any case. You can actually, a child can consume a whole couple of tubes of toothpaste and nothing will happen to a child. That's what they say for fluoride. But anyway, so that was found out. And then the attack was made and the matter was put down. So that is one of the ways in which it was uh, dealt with very effectively, but with the help of the parent body, that is the Dental Association. Uh, we have about five minutes left and I, I do want, I, I had a couple of topics I wanted to get to, but one I think is important is this whole idea of hashtag activism. Uh, there are some really good examples out there of this. One uh, was uh, aimed at Uber. Uh, Uber suspended surge pricing when protesters were uh, going to the airport. The taxi drivers had, uh, I, you know, I don't remember all of the details, but the taxi drivers, th this all had to do with the immigration policies of, of our uh, president in the U.S., uh, and protesters were going to the airport and, and taxi drivers uh, had taken one position. So Uber suspended their surge pricing uh, and people uh, on the pro-immigration side of this were incensed at Uber's activities. 
uh, during this period and uh, started a hashtag campaign that was delete Uber, uh, which was very successful, very effective. A lot of people said, OK, I'm just going to use Lyft from now on if that's the political position that Uber is going to take. Um, so, I mean, that's one example of this. Uh, another was uh, one of the survivors of the Parkland school shooting uh, who organized, I mean, he's, he's been very active, but uh, one of his most successful campaigns was to pressure Fox News uh, to drop support, uh, actually to pressure advertisers to drop support for one of Fox News's uh, anchors um, because of this anchor's position on uh, gun control in the wake of that shooting. And uh, she lost a, a ton of advertisers. Uh, these things come as a result of a specific action. They're not already organized around this. The organization does something and people react by creating a hashtag campaign that everybody piles on very, very quickly. I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot to trend on Twitter. So in, in that type of a situation where you're looking at actual revenue loss, uh, what do you do? Okay, then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think the rules have changed. There's, there's like four or five questions you want to ask. You know, are employees asking about it? Are, the, are shareholders asking about it? You know, are people who care about it involved in it to some degree? Are people reacting to it in some way that is detrimental that we need to respond to? Um, some of these things do have an impact, but Uber is huge. Uh, some of these companies, in many respects, are too big to succeed and too big to fail. But they're also humongous targets for these kinds of sort of fun and games. And you know, this relates to the earlier question: you know, what if a small group comes along and does things? It, you know, it, it's it's a judgment game as to how much effort and energy you're going to put into this because if, if every time you have a situation like this and you're the one who's shouting fire you this is the chicken little problem we have as as the advisors everything's a crisis and therefore nothing's a crisis um it's just a judgment call uh the last thing i wanted to raise here before i let you know what's coming up next month uh, David Armano over at Edelman wrote a piece that says there's there's four stages of of consumer activism uh, that that consumers go through. Uh, they say first of all it's the awareness of the issue, uh, and they either have a positive or a negative reaction. Um, then there is affinity around the issue, uh, again either a positive or a negative one. Uh, then comes the advocacy where they're either going to recommend or trash your brand. Uh, based on the position that you have taken or the act, act, act the action that you have um, engaged in. And then finally, there's activism, which is where they take uh, more tangible action to uh, benefit or, or, or harm your organization. And uh, the question is, uh, can you catch people in the three earlier phases before they become activists if you're paying attention to what people are talking about out there? Well, I suppose you have to be very, very vigilant at every step of your operations in a company to find out what exactly is going on. And uh, uh, that also brings in the question of uh, um, honesty and truthfulness. Um, you know, it depends on how much truthful and how much honest you are uh, in your operations and how quickly you can find out the lapses which are plaguing your company. And admit them, admit to the mistakes and say, sorry, that's very important. And further going forward, taking precautions like the crisis management plan, the comms plan, the security breaches plan, you know, those have to be in place. My sense would be that you, it, 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 this is it, one of the growing trends in companies is to expose and discuss these be behaviors and circumstances internally very quickly. Um, because uh, everybody's everybody in the company is basically looking around and seeing what people are doing, hearing people are saying, and wondering why we aren't responding to them. Uh, to me, when these things occur, that's the place to begin and to get some some advice and wisdom from the folks who are working for you, based on what the company. This is really the, the previous comment. You know, the attitude, the values, um, the the uh, behavior of the company as an organization, as a social unit. Um, 
and many times when these things happen, uh, more increasingly is what I'm seeing is, is companies are attuned to talking about these things inside, and then they make a decision about how much outside activity they're going to have. Great. And it is the, the top of the hour. Uh, so uh, we have to wrap the conversation up here. want to thank everybody on the panel. Also want to thank Anna Willey, who organizes, coordinates all of these sessions. We couldn't do this without her behind the scenes assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the next Circle of Fellows, episode number 46, will take place on Thursday, June 20th. If you want to kind of uh, have a sense of when these happen. It's always the third Thursday of the month, uh, same time uh, at noon Eastern. Uh, the topic is artificial intelligence. What's next and why you should care. Uh, we'll have Amanda Hamilton Atwell on that panel, Mary Hills, Ned Lundquist, and Roger Dupree. Uh, so it should be uh, a, a really fascinating discussion because I'm, I'm not 100% convinced that outside of advertising, uh, and marketing, a lot of communicators are paying that close attention to artificial intelligence and the impact that it might have on uh, what we do and uh, their organizations. So uh, join us for that. Um, again, thanks, everybody, for the time. Uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you all. Are, are, are you all coming to the conference in June? Yes. Yeah, me too. Bish, are you going to be there? No, I'm not coming. <laughs> no, oh well. <laughs> George, are you joining us? George is frozen up again. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, and um, really appreciate all of your insights. Uh, and for anybody listening, this will all be available as a podcast and a video replay within the next day or two. So thanks, until sir. next month. Bye-bye. Take care. Hey, everyone. Thank, bye -bye. You. Thank, thank you so much.